All right, welcome everyone to the 12th annual Transforming Trauma Conference. As we continue on day two, I'm here with an awesome team of OCAD students. Um, we're gonna start off with a land acknowledgement first before we begin our presentation today. We acknowledge that the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of the many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, Métis peoples. We acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Thank you everyone uh, for being here today. Uh, we have a couple of members already here with us from the OCAD team. I'm going to uh, pass it on to them to introduce themselves. I have Mia and Riley here and we'll have two more members uh, here shortly. Lauren and Drew will be joining us as well. Welcome everyone who's uh, able to join us here today in the uh, webinar and welcome everyone who's watching this online. Feel free to post comments on our Facebook page. I will be uh, responding to those uh, as we go along and also in the chat, I'll be monitoring that. I'm gonna pass it on to Mia who's gonna get us started today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Mia um, and I'm a student at OCAD University currently studying uh, creative writing and I'm in my third year um, and I'm really excited uh, to be in this event. I was really looking forward to it. Um, I'm also an international student. So this is my third year in Canada. So I'm happy to be here and, uh, and please uh, stay tuned for our poetry presentation. And I'll pass it on to Riley. Thank you, Mia. I'm Riley Goldstein, a third year creative writing student specializing in entrepreneurship and social innovation at OCAD University. I am very thankful for our organizers who have arranged our session today and for being a part of the very supportive and generous community of OCAD University, as well as the Gatehouse. I appreciate your invitation. Thank you, Riley and Mia, for introducing yourselves. We're still having some tech issues getting the other two members of your team online, but I will keep uh, working on that. I see that Ian has joined us as well. Um, Ian, if you want to introduce yourself as well while you're here. Thanks. Uh, really appreciate everyone uh, joining us today. Uh, my name is Ian Ketaku, uh, multimedia artist and writer uh, and instructor at OCAD University. Uh, this presentation is uh, really special for us. Uh, we've been in collaboration with Gatehouse for the past couple of months, been able to explore certain themes. Uh, the theme for this year's conference, Transforming Trauma, uh, has been really important for us. And a couple of days ago, on Sunday, we were able to facilitate a symposium and a workshop. And this workshop focused on how to write through trauma or how to write from trauma. And we understood uh, trauma to mean a number of different things. And we explored uh, these issues through personal anecdotes, but also through the literary techniques necessary to create effective and engaging works that also act as therapeutic and beneficial to the author and to the audience. We were joined by a number of students, some of uh, whom you will hear from today. And we were also joined by Cassandra Myers, a, uh, a, a queer Asian Italian poet based in Toronto. She was able to guide our group through a process of thinking about our writing through a trauma-informed lens, even though this idea of a trauma-informed lens uh, could be uh, challenged and deconstructed. And so it was a wonderful afternoon uh, full of you know, tears and joy and lots of great insight 
we were able to uh, provide resources and watch and read other works of other poets who have uh, explored these issues. And so as we go on today, we hope that uh, both the readers, the student readers and the audience find uh, some comfort, find some insight and find uh, some empathy with the stories that we are about to hear. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of go um, a little bit of a round robin. And this round robin is going to, uh, we're gonna go student by student. Uh, we have a number of students uh, that are going to be presenting today. Uh, we know that the session is listed for uh, an hour, but I believe that we'll go a shorter than that. Uh, the students have written uh, incredible pieces uh, specifically for this event, and uh, hopefully you enjoy. Uh, the first poet that's coming up, I'm just going to read their bio one more time, just so that we get their, uh, get everyone uh, situated properly. I don't know if people have access uh, to the chat, but feel free when you hear something that you like to throw in some hands, to throw in some emojis, uh, to snap your fingers, to stomp your feet. These are the kinds of reactions that we like. And if you're not able to do so, you can do so within your own heart, within your own mind. All of that is absolutely welcome. So I'm just going to uh, read the bio for Mia. Just gonna find it really quick here. Sorry, actually, Maria, do you have the bio handy? Would you? M Mia is our first on deck. Thank you so much. So, uh, Mia Lamia is an international student from Bangladesh. They are a third year creative writing student at OCAD University with an avid passion for poetry and storytelling. They are committed to working towards social change, especially for marginalized communities and international students, which they are part of that community, who don't have access to resources and have precarious working and living conditions. They can find, uh, you can find Mia uh, at Instagram at L.M.I.A. and OCAD U Live, which is the OCAD University uh, TV show where they host their own show called Morning with Mia. If we can uh, throw our ASL applause, our snapping fingers, our emojis in the chat, let's give it up for Mia Lamia. Thank you so much, Anne. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for coming and being here. Um, <clears throat> for me, this poetry uh, piece that I wrote, um, I just wanted to put it out there that there are trigger warnings um, of um, sexual abuse and aftermath of trauma. So if you please like need some time to uh, take care of yourself and please feel free to step away if you know the words are you know trigger you. Um, and I just want this to be a healing space. And um, most of it is mostly uh, metaphorical, uh, but I really, wanted to talk about, um, you know, because for me, um, coming here as a newcomer, you don't really have access to resources. And oftentimes you get taken advantage of a lot of newcomers also they become victims of sex trafficking and abuse in a lot of ways. Uh, so this poetry addresses that as well as victim blaming. Oftentimes women are blamed for um, the way they dress. And uh, there's a lot of sexualization of women on the clothing, based on the clothing they wear. So um, for me, um, it was important to um, bring forth my experience, uh, but also address his concerns. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Um, I'll start the poetry. Uh, this poem is called The Little Black Dress. I saved up 
that delicate sheer fabric. Embellish dream stitch delicately since my dreams have always been fragile. I long to wear short skirts with shaved legs, hair dancing freely in the breeze for the first time. A cleavage displayed like beautiful mother of pearls. Red lipstick without being called a hooker. I fantasized about clothes that exposed my skin in a country where the law is not against my kind. To the West I go with my suitcase full of haute couture. I'm the undomesticated goddess in a new world. However, even Eve was ravished by a serpent so vile as I was standing in my little bag, black dress, clutching my passport in my hand, the serpent wrapped itself around my leg and pulled me toward him. The lips, the hips, and then in onwards it went, paralyzed and mute. I can't remember what happened, but I, got my period the next day, the deep red blood aftermath of trauma. I asked, is this my punishment for wanting to be free? To show just a little bit of exposed skin. I tore off my little, little black dress of dreams and locked the remaining ones back in my suitcase. I'm even more careful about what I wear now. My mom would have been proud of my modesty. It was never the clothes that made me a victim. And that's for my uh, poem. And um, I, um, I think it was important for me <laughs> to write this to get it, oh, to get it um, in a poetic form. Um, um, as a woman, uh, because I, uh, I live in Bangladesh where uh, we were always told to cover up. So uh, for me, when I, um, people would tell me like, oh, once you go to the West, you can wear whatever you want, like it's a safe country. But, you know, like I just wanted to address that it's really hard for us to feel safe no matter where. Um, so, yeah. Um, and I'm glad that there are like a lot of resources. So um, it's very important for me, like even as students that in OCAD, we have um, a lot of campaigns around um, sexual violence and also um, teach others how to be better allies. Um, so now we have like a sexual violence counselor and a counselor for newcomers as well, like international students. Uh, so, um, it's great when students make these changes. Uh, and we also have like a lot of constant workshops as well. Thank you so much, Mia. Mia, I, I um, you know, a lot of times when we're having these conversations about uh, transforming trauma, um, particularly with, uh, with sexual violence or sexual trauma, um, we have a very westernized view and a very westernized perspective of how we look at these issues and how we explore these issues. And, um, you know, you've been in the country for uh, a few years now and still within your piece, I, I saw the inter international connectivity do you believe that when exploring these issues that um, we need to take into account different cultures, different understandings, and how do we as people who are born and live and settled in the West, how can we uh, take a view towards uh, you know, other, the other world or the other countries um, that, more so embraces um, empathy and sympathy as opposed to prescribing uh, action. I'm reminded of, you know, the kind of movements that would uh, offer prescriptions to, for instance, Muslim women or those who wear the veil or the niqab or the hijab um, and how our perspectives in the West don't necessarily align over there and might not be so effective uh, to transmit um, over to that side. I just wanted to know your thoughts a bit about that. 
Yeah, no, um, I know. I think, you know, there's always been this East and West mentality. So I, I, I really definitely do agree and resonate with that. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting because like um, for most of all, like sometimes there are like a set of rules, like you're on, so, like, you're on like, you know, women in like different countries, but at the end, like it's more, you need to um, really have empathy as a really great tool and create this space, like such as this one where we can like go like, and you know, er, and it's a space for like all of us and everyone. So I hope that when I go back, like, you know, um, and I feel like um, most countries don't also don't have sex education. So where I come from, we don't have that. So I think like, that's very important to really uh, have that as part of curricula and from, for a lot of, um, you know, like countries, like developing nations. Um, and, and I think like, you know, like what I learned is, you know, like things are really changing. And I think like we are, we need, li we live in a time where people are quick to question and quick to like, you know, fight against oppression as well. And we have the resources and tools thanks to like our connection with the community. And, you know, we get to like, really see and hear from a lot of perspectives. Um, but it's still a work in progress as well. There's some beautiful comments uh, in, in the chat, lots of hearts. Uh, one from uh, Sabra says, Mia, thank you. Very powerful transforming poetry, deconstructing notions of freedom, the West and sexism, your vulnerability and strength. And uh, a couple of, uh, Star, starry eyed uh, emojis. You were part of the symposium um, this past Sunday. Uh, could you give me a, a little bit of insight into what the experience was like for you? Anything that you uh, took home from the symposium? Thank you. Uh, for me, it was really, uh, it was such a great experience. Uh, I think sometimes when, before I would just like write about poetry without you know, write about my experience without really thinking that there are so many other ways where I don't really have to tell the full truth because sometimes I'm just not, not ready for the ex that experience. So it was really great for us to like talk about what other resources and tools, like a lot of metaphors. And sometimes, you know, it's okay if you don't want to explore like certain memories that really hurts you. And, and I think the biggest thing that I love is the aftercare uh that writing writing about experiences like this and also like having this in the space we all need the after aftercare that we uh really really deserve so i'm i'm i really hope that this space has also been a healing space for you um yeah um and as i mentioned like in ocad we have a number of initiatives as well uh we partner with white Ribbon uh, for a constant workshop as well as um, Dandelion Initiative for su Survivors. So I really hope that, you know, and also like Gatehouse, like, thank you so much for hosting this and just like having like the counselors and ready uh, on the spot. Um, so it really means a lot um, to have that um, care. Um, and thank you for the resources. I think um, I this was a way for me to also like share a truth, but also like have that activism piece into it. Amazing, thank you so much, Mia. We're gonna bring you back a bit later uh, when we have our panel, uh, really appreciate it. We're gonna move on to um, another student, uh, Riley. Riley Goldstein is an interdisciplinary art student of arts and sciences being gifted with the writing capabilities with a poet's eye who initiates positive change through their work. Like an alchemist, Goldstein or Goldstein, 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 Stein? I'm gonna get it right this time. Stein, you've got it, you've got Stein. it. Right. Oh, thank you. Goldstein uh, transforms writing and design into creative communication that inspires her viewers. Riley Goldstein, um, Steen who loves digital marketing, celebrating cultural exhibitions through community projects. Riley's passion lies in narrative storytelling, using mixed media to showcase her creative talents, 
hybrid and experimental writing, lyrical essay, poetry, memoir, short fiction, and journaling. Specializing in entrepreneurship and social innovation, Riley collaborates with like-minded individuals who share her passion for helping others. Riley volunteers her technical skills, facilitating creative workshops and conducting psychology-informed research as she executes her next creative project. Let's show some hearts in the air, some emojis in the chat, some ASL applause, some snaps, some stomps of the feet for Riley Goldstein. Thank you for that very uplifting introduction, Ian. So, the first poem that I'll be reading is called Whoosh. Whoosh. I breathe solace, tasting flurries of foam, fantasizing of feathers, caressing the water, cleansing. I am here. This moment turns gray stones into safe spaces, contemplating nothing, enjoying my pencil tracing over my pages in the books, carrying across the next moment. Until tomorrow, friend. Dear Gaia, I endure catching glimpses of you. I appreciate your illusions, miracles, and consequences. Everything about you intrigues me. Dear Sunset, we drift together. Two beings coasting along the horizon of our thoughts. I feel you caress my lips and bathe my body in sparkles. Ocean whispers lullabies to skies on blue afternoons. When I'm swimming, on the shoreline in Paradise, Cabbage, Goodman's Beach. My feet sink beneath the comfort of your reach. Gritty and rough and soft in spaces I do not expect. I am happy to see you, even when you taste like oranges and salt. I am one being melting into the universe. I accept you, sunset, sunrise. Meditation among grandmother moon's loving gentle storm. Like her, I am shy. And when moonbeams or sparkles meet my eyes, I show a new aspect of me. I am a sliver one day, fully blossoming the next. Human beings are as mystical as weatherscapes. And last but not least, how to forgive. Learn to be forgiving. An open cloud welcoming a rainbow, still rising after every storm. Through lightning, quaking earth, fear and failure. 
stay in the sky. Come nightfall, spread thin, straying into morning. Accept the sun. Glide ahead through strikes, not hiding, only releasing a cloud. Always changing, never ceasing. It's softness on dark days. Learn to be forgiving. Thank you for listening. I wrote these poems inspired by how nature and the environment can reflect what one being is experiencing within and how what a human emotion can sound like or taste like or feel like through the lens of an element that is not quite tangible. And in trauma, there's a lot of events or thoughts and feelings that may be difficult to explain or conceptualize or take a photo of and show it to somebody has to explain. So in this way, we are very complex beings and I embrace that. So even when I find it a challenge to understand a situation right away, I embrace that it's okay not to know or have the answers to everything because we're human. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Really beautiful, Riley. Thank you so much. There's some uh, really amazing love uh, that everyone's showing to you in the chat. Mia says such beautiful imagery. Victoria with a uh, a rose oh. and Maria with a sunflower. Where, where are y'all finding these very special uh, fauna emojis? I, I love them. <laughs> uh, Sabra says, Riley, thank you. Your imagery captures hope, oh. deep inner strength and expansive gratitude to nature's wonderful gifts, healing and embracing. Oh, oh that's gorgeous. Wow. Oh, some really great love. Uh, uh, from Lillian Allen via Facebook, yay, healing the world. Oh, Victoria's was a tulip, not a rose, even mm. more specific, I love it. Oh. So, uh, you know, as you mentioned, your uh, Dear Gaia, it, for instance, uh, your poem Dear Gaia speaks about the personification, Gaia being a personification of Earth, uh, a representation of mother nature. And when, you know, when you bring up these uh, uh, illusions of nature, of uh, the world around us, the non-human world, um, I'm reminded of the trauma that human beings have inflicted upon Gaia or upon mother nature. Mm. We also think about, I also think about the biomimicry or uh, you know, using the earth and using nature as a catalyst to give human beings lessons on how to relate to each other, relate to ourselves, relate to nature. What is it about, um, about nature, about the natural world that you think we could learn from in regard to uh, tackling trauma? It's a good question. I think we can learn that while an event or situation may be unexpected, that the unexpected can be positive as well. You also, uh, in the last piece that you read, um, which I really love, how to forgive. Um, a lot of 
again, nature informed, weather informed uh, lines. Forgiveness is a tough, is a tough, uh, it's, a, it's a tough word. It's a tough concept, especially when uh, tackling such issues that uh, this conference uh, and, and the works that uh, the poets are reading today. And, you know, this is an open question. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I don't have the answer. What role does forgiveness have for you in particular within your, within your writing? You know, as, as a writer and as an educator of literature, I sometimes believe that there has to be an element, an element of forgiveness. And obviously forgiveness looks different for everyone, but there has to be an element of forgiveness, either forgiving yourself uh, forgiving, forgiving the emotions that come with it in order to, in order to write about it. And furthermore, in order to present that writing, but that's just me. I'm just wondering your thoughts on, I, on forgiveness and writing. I feel really passionate about that. And I'm so glad that you asked that question. Forgiveness has been playing a very large role has a giant stake in my inner work that I do through meditation and also through my, ther my own form of therapy writing. It's the process of engaging with this myself and developing self-compassion and building upon the practices that I have and also in the same way one may lift up a child when the child falls down while they're learning to walk, I will continue my practice doing the small things so that like uh, kaijin, like waking up in the morning, setting that alarm, all of these things, these tiny things, I think even when, let's say, one of them isn't done when I thought I would be done, then I just tell myself, it's okay, like, human, I, get, I wake up, I get up mentally, physically, and I move about my day and I continue to also practice positive affirmations, kind of presence, I'm here, I'm grateful. It's about like, trusting myself, there are many moments in my life where I'm forgiving of others more so than myself. So when I turn inwards, I ask myself, why am I feeling this way? Or how is the weather influencing me? Then I find that I better understand myself and also appreciate myself. And sharing my work is also a way of forgiveness too, because I was holding a lot of me back, not just creatively, emotionally too. So by me presenting this, it's also me willing to let go of wanting to be perfect because there is no such thing. I would hope one day to eliminate that from vocabulary. It's not possible. However, I will say, to redefine what that is, not perfect. I think for me, being content and feeling, feeling happy is well, happy as in, I feel good right now, I feel present. And I am very stunned and also humbled by everyone's support today and not just today through the course of my uh, studies at Okadu, even outside of the classroom, and meeting everyone, seeing you today, feels like a breath of fresh air. Amazing. Thank you so much, Riley. And you know, 
uh, I'm, I'm reminded of one of the tools that uh, when you talk about your self-care, um, uh, I'm reminded of one of the tools uh, that uh, our spokesperson on uh, the symposium, Cassandra Myers reminded us of, is you know, whenever you are um, feeling detached from oneself, reconnect with your body. Uh, she does this interesting thing where, you know, just two fingers to the wrist and just feeling where you are. But also what Riley was saying, right? Just noticing um, the things that are around you, right? What's the sun like? What's the weather like? Um, how are the plants and nature responding to you? And how are you responding to that? And that can be some grounding moments for you. Um, some wonderful comments. Uh, Victoria says, uh, from Kathy, Riley, such wonderful reflection, nature's wonder. Maria um, asked the great question, what is forgiveness? This is a unique definition for each survivor, facts. It is not prescriptive. That's totally right. Uh, Lillian Allen from Facebook says, the late great indigenous poet, Lee Miracle, rest in peace, says that the earth is a wounded healer. As we heal, the earth heals. And as the earth heals, we too can heal. Uh, Beza Thank you for sharing that, Lily. Be Bezait, I apologize uh, for the pronunciation mistake. Uh, forgiveness is a tool, a healing tool. Sabra says, forgiveness does not mean condoning the abuse and trauma. Forgiveness is a path to healing of self and the world around us. Oh yeah, I'm feeling the good vibes. And we're gonna keep those good vibes going. Thank you so much, Riley. Uh, we'll bring you back. Uh, for our uh, wrap up panel. Thank you. So uh, next up, I'm going to be introducing Drusilla Gary, also known as Drew Gary, is a queer BIPOC poet studying creative writing at OCAD U. She loved words and the act of stringing them together to create arrangements that are both beautiful and meaningful. She finds inspiration in the intangible and attempts to create images out of abstract thought in an effort to understand and ground herself. She has written on topics such as love between women, imagined breakups, muddled identity, and Taylor Swift. She ultimately seeks truth and healing through her practice. Let's give an ASL applause, some snaps in the building, some heart emojis, some tulips, roses, sunflowers. You know what it is. It's Drew Gary. Welcome. Hi, Ian. Thank you so much. Sorry I was a little late. I had some technical issue, but um, yeah, I have a couple pieces I would love to share right now. Thank you again for the amazing introduction. Okay, so I will get into it. The first piece is called Rawhide. Rawhide. The things that I want boreholes in the soft erode gentle thoughts, black silk line coats, with which knife did you carve this curse? One passed down through curved lineage, sprawling tree roots. I'm here now carrying the same weathered pain, beating my chest with the same chap fist. I want but one woman, tucked into the crook of my elbow under my blue wing, flapping, circling. Here I find the one thing I need, the one thing I've always needed. How silly to think the, the lure the same as the rawhide rope the curse of consolidation, the making many form oneness. So that's the first one. Um, and then the second one is called Sky Blues. So Sky Blues, starched, impurities in the stain, charcoal rubbed into ashy gray, days like pulled rubber, snap don't break. In the middle of the sky, the anvil sinks between my hip bones. One more bad day and I fear the sheet will catch the water-willed breeze. Unbound by the normal order, fear fills the thick pipes from my heart center. Cement dries. The harding cracks the cylinder, all systems down, all systems down. Pure chaos of the adrenal source the tingle of the exterior parts, deepening of the interior, an extension all the way down through souls to the pulsing core of my home. Shaky in construction, mudslide foundation, sparkling despite. 
So that's the second one. And I have one more for you that I will read now. Um, it's called Noon. Noon. Tallies like palindromes, I see both sides. Look in the mirror, then at the palm of my hand. I'm holding fragmented amber with a beetle hardened in the center. There is nothing, no thought, no truth, only scramble, only jumble, only the same rumination, running, 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 the perimeter of my mind. I admire the concise. I love the long-winded. I ask a friend what she had for dinner. She lists every spice in the dish, cumin, cardamom, chili flakes, cloves, coriander, fennel, ginger, nutmeg, turmeric, sea salt, and ground pepper. Additionally, lemon juice, mint, garlic, coconut sugar. I melt for the meticulous detail, for the unedited description. I long for her to read me a recipe. She'll read every word, every measurement, every possible substitution, every footnote. Thoughts churned, fluffed, spun, kneaded, a day, a bowl, a potential connection. How I long for one conversation, one sprawling word, one mumbled song, no latches, no tethers, no leather stirrups or copper horseshoes, mixed up, stirred, whisked, existence through thought, the thoughts incoherent without method, broken down, humble shatters, impossible to perceive with the most conscious of tides. So those are the pieces um, that I wanted to read for today. Thank you so much for listening. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Such beautiful work and incredible vivid, vivid and, and rich imagery. So many lines and uh, images that really stuck with me, you know, an anvil in the sky between my hips, uh, the fragmented amber, all the spices, you really are evoking the senses, also got me a little hungry, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm wondering what role poetry, you know, I'll, I'll go back up just a little bit. In our symposium, we talked a little bit about how difficult it is to write about certain certain issues. And sometimes poetry gives us a loophole or a way to circumvent re-triggering ourselves and or the audience. And one way to do that is to take the abstract and make it and make it specific. I feel like your camera lens is so zoomed in that we see minute details and very specific objects and uh, ornaments that have that carry so much meaning and you know oftentimes words like uh, you know forgiveness or uh, or uh, larger words like uh, empathy or hurt or pain or trauma are so big and as was mentioned before it means different things to different people how are you able to take the abstract and make it specific to provide insight to what you're, what you're talking about? Where does your mind go when you first sit down to write? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think um, my writing process sort of feels like, um, like I'll, I'll let my thoughts sort of like run around and then something will stick like the um, when I was talking about the spices and the food that um, I was thinking of the intimacy of like I do have this one specific friend who actually if you ask her what she ate she will go into it like that and um, the intimacy of that and like the sort of like this like mundane intimacy of the the spices so I will take like a moment like that and then let it just like spiral into whatever. So even that like mundane intimacy feels a bit like healing to me just to have this like peace in these um, mundane moments. And obviously it's like a really small moment, but it feels um, special and healing and peaceful. And I think, yeah, sort of like taking a moment like that and then letting it become what it becomes sort of what, what happened, yeah. Nice. I, and, and, you know, I feel like this has been a, a thread uh, throughout this morning 
is uh, awareness and um, presence. And, uh, you know, there's a, there's a word that I'm looking for, just being, being, being present, being aware, and uh, how that can be a healing and therapeutic process as well. Uh, we have some wonderful comments. I'm really loving Saber's comments. Uh, uh, they say, Drusilla, amazing poetry, espre expressive of the need for love, connectivity, longing, journeying, security, and safety. Lots of hearts, lots of uh, amazing emojis. What's this one? Victoria, you gotta let me know what that one is. Uh, we got some roses, we got some claps. Uh, Saber says, Ian, thank you for helping me find the words I was looking for. Evocative and thought provoking to describe Drusilla's very tactile and sensuous imagery. Uh, Kathy says, Drew, thank you for sharing your poetry left with your words sparkling despite. Uh, from Lillian Allen on Facebook, working the spices to get the senses jumping in the pepper pot of triumph, breathing to open the heart and eyes, healing. Oh, even mm -hmm. the comments are, are so poetic, so uh -huh. amazing. Um, I am cautious of time. Thank you so much, Drew. Really appreciate you. And uh, we're yeah. going to bring up to the stage Lauren Frechette. Uh, I'm just going to read their bio real quick. you know, momentum. Lauren, are you in the building? Lauren is here, Lauren is here. You know, momentum. So uh, Lauren uh, Frechette, is a 22-year-old first-year student in the creative writing program at OCAD University. For them, poetry has become a sort of longtime friend and teacher in their life. Writing has helped them navigate the murky waters of trauma, reclaim their voice, and most importantly, remind them to acknowledge the quiet beauty in everyday life. Y'all know what to do. ASL applause some snaps in the air, some emojis in the building, stomping of the feet. Please, let's welcome Lauren Brashad. Hey, Lauren, you're live and in effect. Okay, perfect. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I have one piece that I uh, would like to read. Um, so let's just get into it. Um, this piece is called The Morning After. After, I was in therapy for years. CBT worksheets plotted purposefully amongst childhood paraphernalia. From corners, soft lamplight was thrown like a duvet trying to drape coziness over the confining clinical unease. And they were all the same. Like a drugstore Halloween costume labeled safe space, it was a factory made attempt to resemble the real thing. On gray walls hung posters advertising healing as a landscape with peaks and valleys. True as it may be, the message seemed a joke from the merry-go-round's plastic saddle. One after the other, well-meaning professionals gobbled up veiled confession. I can't eat because it'll make my thighs too big. It was easier to offer up than I can't eat because looking like a woman is what drew him in. Full from my empty bellied half truths, they would rub their satisfied stomachs, nodding as they prescribed me a 50 milligram prize. After, I became lost in a body that no longer felt mine, shame sinking me deeper by the day. Not long was I gone before the missing signs went up around me. The photo used was of the girl before. My family and my friends searched, pleaded, despaired, but soon the search was abandoned. And from my warm corpse, I watched as my mother, destroyed by guilt, believing she had failed me, mourned her child watched as my friends moved on, unable to keep reaching outward, only to return with untouched palms. I watched as my kind father, 
eyes heavy and confused, opens his arms wide like a shoreline of pure hope, and he calls me to make my way back to him, desperate for an embrace from his lost child. It would be five long years until I would return to the warm sands of touch. After you gave me this shame, shame that denied delicious food, lovingly made with intention and care, shame that shut me out from the world, from relationships, from school, from parties, from sex, from me. Years pass by under the weight of its control. But now I know that this shame you gave me isn't mine. The burden, the disgust, the blame, the things you placed in me when you took away my childhood and my voice, I can see now they were never actually mine. This shame is yours. Now, after all this time, you take it back. In loving memory of before. So that's that. Oh. Drew says, uh, such beautiful healing work, Lauren, snaps. I just want to meditate on, on, on the piece a little bit and um, such important work for so many, for so many reasons. You start the piece drawing connections to the medical world. CBT, uh, cognitive behavior, behavior therapy worksheets the 50 milligram prize. I remember in our workshop, Cassandra Myers really helped us by deconstructing what is, as you know, paraphrasing, but what she referred to as a colonial approach to therapy. And oftentimes, you know, we, if we, if, when we hear about uh, mental health and we hear about um, trauma and uh, the effect that it has uh, on individuals, we're often focused on, you know, here's uh, the self-care that you need to do. Here's the therapy that you need to take. Here's the medicine that you need to ingest. Rarely do we explore the adverse effects of those kind of processes. And within this piece, you were able to really show that, um, that contradictory nature of some of, these, uh, of some of these systems and how those systems can actually contribute uh, to the trauma in a, in a negative way. Um, some, you know, a, a couple of lines that just really, floored me. I can't eat because it'll make my thighs too big. It was easier to offer up than I can't eat because looking like a woman is what drew him in. This kind of battle between ideas, the, the dilemma that exists inside is something that's not spoken about a lot. Oftentimes it's, you know, either you're either your victim or your perpetuator, either you're this or you're that, it's often black and white. And within this piece, you were able to explore the nuances and the juxtaposition of, of thoughts and, and ideas. I'm just wondering um, when writing this piece, what sort of obstacles did you have to overcome? Well, um... For me, writing this piece uh, was kind of a challenge, but it was mainly brought on. I had, I referenced my, can everyone hear me? Okay, good. Um, um, I referenced at the beginning of the piece, my years in therapy and um, one therapist once um, I was finally, I wasn't able to, uh, you know, talk about my trauma 
honestly, probably six years down the line, I went to all these therapists, none of them ever finding out what had happened. So, you know, why I referenced the merry-go-round is because nothing was happening because they didn't know what was, what had happened. And so um, once I had actually um, revealed this truth to um, a therapist down the line, she said to me, why don't, why don't you consider writing a letter to your abuser? You know, I think that would be good for you. And I, 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 I knew where she was coming from, but I was like, I don't want communication with that. Um, they don't deserve communication from me or anything like that. Even if it's not sent, even if it's just for me, I wanted to write to the person that was lost to that trauma, to that abuse, um, because, um, you know, I needed to crack open the shame and the weight that shame can destroy a life, you know, uh, and really get to a place where I understood that it was never mine to begin with, you know, um, and that for me was the most important part of this piece and this um, whole journey is that um, shame is heavy. It is so, it is so heavy. Um, and if you can if you can look it in the eye after, you know, how many years and be able to finally accept that it isn't actually yours, it's not your fault. Um, I feel like that's the moment when you can actually start doing the work of the healing. Um, so that was, that was kind of what um, this was all started by. The, the recommendation to write a letter to um, an abuser when really I wanted to write a letter to myself and who I lost, so. Wow, wow. thank you for sharing uh, that, that journey. You know, in, in the poetic form, we call it uh, the epistolary, you know, the, the, the letter or the dedication. And uh, you've used this tool in such a wonderful way. I'm just gonna read a couple of comments just to let everyone know where we're at. We're just wrapping up. Um, feel free, uh, Drew, Mia, Riley, to come back on the on the on the floor. Um, I'll just read a couple of these comments, and then uh, we'll end with a a, a lasting word. Um, please check out uh, the Gatehouse website for resources um, if you um, are uh, in need of uh, uh, Gatehouse.org. If you're in need of uh, support or someone to talk to, uh, you can find uh, many great resources there. Uh, uh, Riley says, I appreciate your vulnerability, Lauren. Thank you for sharing, drawing upon your strength. Sabra says, Lauren, love your poetic and revealing critique of therapists and your forgiving tenderness towards your parents. Mm. Your strength and transforming potential shines through. Kathy says, thank you, Lauren. Your words mean more to me than you may ever know. Wow. Um, uh, Maria agrees. Uh, Sabra says, loves how you challenge binaries. Um, Maria says, thank you for sharing, Lauren. Your story inspires others to share and heal from trauma. Um, I wanna thank uh, The Gatehouse. I wanna thank Maria. Uh, I wanna thank everyone behind the scenes who made this happen. The creative writing uh, poetry pro or the creative writing program at OCAD University, Lillian Allen, uh, the creator and founder of the program. I want to thank um, our participants, Lauren, Riley, Mia, Drew. Um, I want us to end with just a word and you can put it in the chat as well. Uh, just a word that summarizes how you're feeling right now or a word that perhaps is going to take you into the rest of the day. Just a word that you're meditating on at the moment. I can give a start. Actually, mine and Maria's are the same grateful grateful is my word lauren uh i'll go up with you um i'm feeling light i'm feeling I, light yeah i enjoy it riley i'm feeling blessed to be here right nice. surrounded by a really positive and uplifting group of individuals and community I'm sorry about 
<laughs> Thank you. Blessed, grateful. Sabra says energized. Mia? Yeah, I, I feel very inspired and also very safe. So thank you so much, everyone. Inspired and safe. All right, I'll hand it back to Maria. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Ian, and thank you for being such a wonderful host of the session today. Uh, thank you to all OCAD students who are here today, Lauren, Riley, uh, Mia, and Drew. Your poetry is inspiring so many uh, people out there watching this and, and people that you'll likely never meet um, to heal from trauma. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today, all the attendees that were here and all your wonderful comments. Thank you, Lily and Alan, who's been so active on Facebook commenting throughout. Um, and thank you, OCAD, you, and guess special thanks to Kathy uh, and also the Gatehouse founder, Arthur Lockhart. And I see that Sabra, our board chair, is also here today. Um, please join us for the next presentation at 1130. It will be Arthur Lockhart, uh, Matthew McVarish, and Stuart Thompson talking about creating a Survivor Council of Canada. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. See you soon. <laughs>